I'll be back in just a minute.
Hey guys, I'm back. You guys hear me? All right. Cool. Yeah. How are you guys doing today? You guys doing all right. Silent? Doing all right. Doing all right. Okay. How's your semester going with the digital learning and all that? I don't like digital learning, but it is what it is. <laughs> it is, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, what do you not like about it? Just the face-to-face the -face interaction uh, and just the one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Um, if you need more of that, so uh, we're about to get today into some more technical science -y sort of stuff. Um, if you need to come by for office hours and things like this, I have the biggest office in the biology department, so there's plenty of space in this room to sit you over there six feet away. Um, so feel free to come by. Uh, just once again, just be masked. After you leave, I'll disinfect the table and all that. Um, but yeah, um, it would be nice if we were all in a group in a room, but um, to the degree that um, you need help with anything, um, I can certainly accommodate you either here in my office or I've done I've done a lot of Zoom meetings with individual students for office hours and things like that as well. So one of the nice things at least is I get to see your faces on Zoom. When I was in lab yesterday with my biology students, um, we were all masked. And that was that was odd and weird. So anyway, uh, how how is the rest of your semester going? Anybody? okay a lot of unknowns and like you just you never know what tomorrow might bring or if you're going to be in person or if you're going to be you know quarantined to your house or just what so gotcha how many of what's that just very unexpected each day okay yeah uh you guys are learning a lot about dealing with uncertainty not necessarily a learning outcome for the college but it'll equip you well for for later life i think um how many of you are in face-to-face um, uh, -face classes? I oh, am. Yeah. Um, okay. How how's the spacing in those going? Good. Okay. There's Everybody stands spread out. Already. What's that? There's only two. We're all spaced out. Okay. All right. So I've got some. I've been receiving some questions about blogging. So. I want to address those here at the beginning. Uh, I've been reading some of your blogs. Some of you have commented on my blog post that I put up. Um, so I'm liking the conversation that is going on. I've made a couple of comments on a couple of blogs. Um, but some of you are having some, some difficulties just accessing things. And so hopefully uh, this will, will help. Uh, if it doesn't, then by all means, uh, schedule either a Zoom meeting to, to try and get it resolved on your computer. While we're on a Zoom meeting, I can always have you share your screen with me and then I can help walk you through things on your actual computer. Or if you uh, feel more comfortable coming into uh, the office, you can do that as well. Just bring your computer and, and I'm sure we'll be able to figure it out uh, quickly enough. So um, on, my, on my toolbar on uh, my in my browser, I actually just have a link for the CTI 259 blog. And when I log on, I get this page here, which is just kind of, it's the Ecology of Food blog. Uh, it tells me who's been visiting, et cetera, et cetera. And the way I post is I go over here to the post, um, the post section here. Um, if I want to see who has done things, I just click on the Ecology of Food blog. And then I can go and visit the actual site. You can see my post that I put up yesterday. And I can see all of your posts. You can click on a post and you can see what people have written. And you can go down and uh, leave a comment if you want. So my question is, when you guys log on to WordPress, do you get this, um, do you get this kind of a, a uh, interface or are you seeing something else? I'm seeing that. Okay, 
So if you want to post, you can either go down to post and start from there, or you can go up here to the right. So click the right thing. And what that will do is that will open up the editor. And um, I say it will open up the editor. Ah, there it is. So you can give your post a title and then you can start writing. And as you're writing, um, it also gives you some links here. So you saw that I put a bunch of images in my post. Uh, you can do that if you feel like. You can also uh, do some formatting of of the text that you're that you're writing in there. You can save these things as drafts, so you don't have to write an entire post all at once. If you want to write a little bit of it now and a little bit of it later, uh, you can save drafts and then and then wait to publish them uh, until you're done. But then when you're done, you need to publish. Click the publish link, and then that'll send it out out to the blog. Um, hey, but Dr. That, Clancy, I'm not seeing nobody else's posts. Okay, uh, let's go back. So you are on, you're on, are you on the, the homepage of the My Home section? Is this Marcus? Yes. Okay. Are you on this page? I, okay, actually I'm not, but it says that I'm connected to Ecology of Food, like your class is on here, but I'm not seeing any of that, like the graphs or, yeah, I'm not okay. seeing any of that. Um, but I can just schedule an, a meeting. Yeah, make an appointment with me and, and yeah. schedule a meeting and we'll we'll probably be able to figure it out. Okay. Um, any, of, any of the rest of you who are having difficulty, probably the same thing, just just come in and we'll get you, we'll get you set up. Um, so for some of you that's going well, I'm, I'm seeing your posts, I'm reading your posts. Uh, there's always a mac and cheese post from somebody. Uh, like every, every semester, there's at least one mac and cheese post. Um, so anyway, keep those coming. And I'm also seeing you guys commenting with one another, which is, which is good. A lot of times you'll get the post done, but you'll forget about the commenting. But, but read other people's posts and, and chime in. Um, The other thing that I want to uh, call attention to is um, on the Moodle site, um, the plant biology, basic plant structure uh, PowerPoints from last time, I've updated them so that I, I deleted those slides that I told you I wasn't going to hold you responsible for the material on them. So that has been updated. So if you downloaded the old file, uh, you should probably uh, download the new file and get rid of the old file. And then of course, uh, today's materials are up. Uh, we're gonna finish the section on uh, basic plant structure and we're gonna go into photosynthesis today. And photosynthesis is gonna require a couple of days to get through and that's what's scheduled in the schedule. So this, um, this slide will, this set of slides will cover both today and Friday. And so just be aware of um, the fact that there may not be a folder for Friday materials because Friday materials are the same as, as today's materials. And then the last thing is some of you had questions about food blogging. So um, you were asking like, how many posts do I need to do? When are they due, et cetera, et cetera. So each food blogging assignment is gonna span two weeks. And oftentimes I'll break it up into what I want you to be commenting on in, during week one and what I want you to be commenting on during week two. If you look uh, through the syllabus, you'll see that I normally expect you to make two posts a week and two comments on other people's posts a week. But for example, in the instructions here, it's like only, I'm only requiring you to post once this week, but you need to respond to two of your colleagues' posts. So anytime that I deviate from what's in the syllabus, I'll put it in the, in the assignment per se. And also in the syllabus, um, in the food blogging portion of the syllabus, I told you, you know, I want you to do this, um, you know, two posts a week over the two weeks and two comments per week over the course of the week. But I also said in that food blogging section, what I don't want you to do is, is get to Friday at the end of the assignment and post, post four posts on Friday at, that is at the end of the two weeks because it prevents other people from reading your posts and commenting on them. And it's just 
there's just a lot to do there there at the end. So the thing to do is is what people are already doing, which is just to space the, the assignment out across the two weeks. So at the end of this two weeks, I'll add to the grade book your your points for the first um, the first food blogging assignment. And so every two weeks, assuming that you've done what I asked you to do in terms of posting and commenting, you'll get full credit for that. And so the, that will start populating at the end of this two week assignment. So um, other questions? All right. Um, do you have any questions over the substance of uh, Monday's class? We we're talking about basic, basic plant structure at that point. So if I gave you a diagram of a plant and it had the shoot and the root, you could label that diagram effectively. That's the kind of thing that would be on the test. Okay. Um, then I'm going to share my screen with you and um, I am having a little bit of breathing difficulty today. Uh, yesterday I taught lab and that took it out of me a lot. So uh, you may see me pausing periodically um, as we're going through this. Um, what can you see from my screen right now? Frog. A big frog. Okay, good. All right. Awesome. That is what I want you to see. Um, let's see. We were, we were talking about plant tissues. So um, I'm going to start there. Vascular tissues in particular. So now you see monocot and dicot vascular tissues? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Cool. So remember that I told you there's this, this um, big division in plants between monocots and dicots. And one of the easiest places to see this is in the arrangement of these vascular tissues. We call them vascular tissues because they're kind of like your vascular system, your, your blood system, and that they're mainly involved in moving fluids around the plant. And the plant is going to be moving fluids in two different directions. In one case, they're going to be moving fluids from the roots up to the leaves. And in the other case, they're going to be moving uh, fluids from the leaves down to the roots. And uh, I've reminded you, oh, and I still didn't, I didn't change that root to shoot to root in the phloem and a root to shoot roots to the leaves in the xylem. So there are different vessels for taking the fluids of the plant to different directions. In monocots and dicots, they're arranged differently. They're kind of scattered around the pith of the monocots. And like I said before, they're, they're scattered around the periphery of the stem in the dicots. And this is what they look like when you look up close. The monocots look kind of like a clown face and the dicots look like just a bunch of cells stacked on top of one another. But in between the xylem and the phloem in the dicots, there is this vascular cambium which produces new phloem to the outside and new xylem to the inside. And uh, this is where we get the, the growth in the diameter of stems of, of dicots. So um, that's, how, that's how they get bigger. Um, they, um, at the apical meristems, that's how they get taller, but these lateral meristems uh, are how they get wider. Uh, so, and then we talked a little bit about the root system, uh, some, some basic structural differences between the root systems and monocots and dicots, which is the fibrous or adventitious root system of monocots and the tap root system of dicots. So we were about to talk about leaves. Um, these are all dicot leaves. And the reason that you can see that they're dicot leaves is that the veins of the leaves, which you see here, can you guys see my arrow? Mm -hmm. The veins branch. They're not parallel to one another, they're branching. So anytime you see the veins branching on a plant, that's usually a sign that it is a, a dicot. There are a small number of species of dicots that have what look like parallel venation, 
but they're relatively uncommon. So this is actually a, a pretty good, a pretty good uh, representation of dicot leaf structure. Um, the space between leaves is referred to as the internode, and the place where the leaves come off is called a node. Um, and they can take all sorts of different forms, simple leaves, compound leaves that are made up of multiple leaflets. You don't really need to know all of that. If you were taking a botany class, um, we, would, we would go into that in some detail. Um, there is one thing that I do want you to know, that this one over here on the far right-hand corner in the upper panel, this is called pinnately compound. Pinnately compound, um, so when leaves are pinnate, they're basically just opposite one another on the branch. And so this whole thing is a leaf and it's made up of leaflets and the leaflets are arranged opposite one another on the stem as opposed to alternate like this. And so this is a pinnately compound leaf. This is the type of leaf that occurs in soybeans. So the only leaf type that I'm going to really expect you to know, well, two leaf types. One is the type of leaf type that is found in legumes, which are things like soybeans. We'll talk about the, the family that, that soybeans belong to at a later time. But this is the leaf shape that they have. And so it's very easy to see um, um, whether or not something is a legume or not by looking at its, at its leaf shape. The other leaf type that I'm going to ask you to know about is the leaf type that we have in, um, in grasses, which is a long thin leaf that has parallel venation all the way down the length of it. And I don't think I have an image of that, although we're gonna see an image of corn uh, at some point, and then I'll, I'll point that out to you when we get to it. What's important for you to know about leaves is the internal structure of the leaf, especially as it uh, pertains to these veins, the, the vascular tissues that run through the leaf that are taking nutrients and water from the roots up to the leaf and that are gathering up the photosynthetic products of the leaf and taking those down for storage in the roots. And the reason that this is important is because when we talk about C3 photosynthesis and C4 photosynthesis, which is something that Pollen is talking about in that second section of chapter one, um, the arrangement of the cells around those vascular bundles is important because that's where the differences between the two different types of photosynthesis is happening. So with that in mind, what I want you to do is on the next slide, so we're gonna learn some basic leaf structure that will help us as we talk about photosynthesis. Once again, if we didn't need to talk about photosynthesis in some detail, I wouldn't make you learn these things about leaf structure. So, um, this is a cutaway view of a leaf. So this is the top of the leaf up here. It has a cuticle, which is this kind of waxy secretion that, that seals the leaf in somewhat. Uh, there's an epidermis. There are what we call palisade mesophyll cells and spongy mesophyll cells. The mesophyll cells uh, are basically just these, these um, cells in the middle of the plant. That's what meso means, it's middle. And these are the cells that are largely responsible for doing photosynthesis. And then running through the middle of this leaf is what we call a vascular bundle. And in the vascular bundle, we have a xylem and we have phloem, the two kinds of vascular tissues. And this is not true of all plants, but a number of plants have a, a layer of cells that go around the vascular bundle, and these cells are called the bundle sheath cells. And so um, the things that you really need to know here in order to understand some of the things that we're going to be talking about is the vascular bundle and the bundle sheath cells, the epidermis, which there's an upper epidermis and there is a lower epidermis. And then the other thing that you need to pay attention to is the, the mesophyll cells and these things called guard cells. Guard cells are these little donut shaped, they form a kind of a donut shaped structure. And what it is, is it's basically a hole in the leaf. And it's a hole in the leaf that allows substances from the outside of the leaf to escape. And it allows substances from the sorry, the inside of the leaf to escape, and it allows substances from the outside of the leaf to come into the leaf. 
And most of these substances that I'm talking about are going to be gases. So as a plant is doing photosynthesis, one of the things that it needs is it needs a supply of carbon di dioxide. That's the starting point of photosynthesis. It's going to be getting carbon dioxide from outside the leaf, and the carbon dioxide gets into the leaf by passing through the opening that is made between these guard cells. That opening is called a stoma. And so that uh, label is up here above this gray arrow. So all leaves have holes in them, and the holes are guarded by guard cells, and these holes can open and close. And so here's one, here is a stoma in this green panel in the upper right hand corner that is relatively open. Here is a stoma that is relatively closed because these guard cells have changed their shape. And so what happens is fluid flows into and out of these guard cells, and as fluid flows in and out of them, it either pumps them up and closes off the hole, or it makes them shrink back and opens up the hole. And the plant opens and closes these holes, these stoma, according to how much it needs to have carbon dioxide in its plant tissues to do photosynthesis. So this is looking at the, the bottom surface of the leaf flat on. This right-hand figure here, lower right-hand figure, is a cross-section through the leaf that is analogous to this cross-section through the leaf. You can see the upper epidermis. You can see the lower epidermis. Here are a couple of guard cells with a stoma that looks mostly closed. Here are a couple of guard cells where the stoma is open. You can see that the spongy mesophyll, it's called spongy mesophyll because the cells are not really packed together very tightly. So there's a lot of air spaces, just like you would have in a sponge. The palisade mesophyll are much more closely packed together. And it's these air spaces where the carbon dioxide is going to be hanging out before it gets picked up by these spongy mesophyll cells and gets converted into sugar. And so photosynthesis is the process of converting carbon dioxide to sugar, and then that sugar is gonna be used as a source of energy for the plant. And so that's the reason why knowing something about the, the structure of a leaf is important for understanding the next phase of what we're going to be doing. Do you have any questions about that? So things that you should be prepared to do on an exam is to get a, a, an image of this plant where I've stripped away all of the labels and I will put letters in different places and I'll be asking you to identify things like the spongy mesophyll, the guard cells, what a stoma is, the vascular bundle, the bundle sheath cells. Those are the structures that are important to know about. The other structures are not so important to know about because they don't play as big of a role in uh, photosynthesis. So bundle sheath cell, the vascular bundle itself, the guard cells that guard the stoma, and the mesophyll cells, but primarily spongy mesophyll, are, are the things that I want to know, want you to know about. And we're going to be revisiting each of these cells over the course of the next two days as we talk about how they play roles in photosynthesis. Do you have study guides for your test? I'm sorry, what? Do you have study guides for your test? Um, I can make a study guide for the test, but what it's basically going to be is a big list of the things that we've, that we've covered. And so I can certainly do that, but uh, one of the things that is like super beneficial is to just go back and review the PowerPoint. If I've taken the time to go and put it on a PowerPoint slide, then chances are the information on there is going to be of, of use to you. What I will probably do is towards the end of next week, I will give you a, a small sample quiz that basically covers the first couple of weeks of material that we've covered so that you can get a feel for the style of the test. Uh, so you can get a feel for how I ask questions on a test and things like this. Um, the tests that we do are gonna be um, online. And so that's gonna be um, a slightly different way than, than how I've tested in this class in the past. Um, so, so it'll give you some insights, but sure, I can, I can publish a, a, 
a study guide. But let me say this, a study guide isn't a list of the questions that are going to be on the test. It's going to be a list of the topics that I'm going to probably touch upon on the test. And right. there's, no guarantee, there's no guarantee that I'll get to all of those on a given test because you only have a certain amount of time to take a test. But uh, it'll definitely include the big things. One of the things that's difficult to test in an online situation is one's understanding of a process. And so the next thing that we do is the process of photosynthesis. And so um, understanding photosynthesis is something that you kind of have to learn in the order that it occurs. And so, you know, step one has to happen before step two can happen. Step two has to happen before step three happens. And so I'm going to give you some, some pointers for how to learn that kind of information uh, as we go through the photosynthesis portion of things. I have a couple of different strategies that I think might help you because to me, learning about photosynthesis is more about telling the story of how photosynthesis proceeds. And so if you can arrange it as a story and kind of hit the plot points that are happening, um, that's a better way of studying it than just trying to pack a bunch of facts in your head that you're, you're going to be prone to forgetting. Um, but as a result of that, it's really difficult for me to write good questions about photosynthesis on a test because I tend to think about photosynthesis myself in a, in a linear process sort of fashion. And so I have, to, I have to pay careful attention to how I'm asking questions about that material so that the way I'm thinking about it translates well into a test question, um, if that makes sense to you. If something doesn't make sense to you, definitely stop me and I'll try to re-explain. All right, so that's the end of this particular set of slides. What we need to do now is we need to go to the slides that are in today's material on the Moodle site that are on uh, photosynthesis. So, All right, photosynthesis, super important topic in plant biology and obviously in agriculture. So um, I'm very focused in the parts of photosynthesis that I'm going to go through with you. Can you guys see the learning goals? All right, cool. So I only want to cover photosynthesis as it's relevant to uh, the differences between C3 and C4 plants. So if you were in a botany class, or an ecology class, or even a cell molecular biology class, we would go through and we would pick apart the nuts and bolts of the light reactions and the, the light dependent reactions, the light independent reactions. But we're only going to be focusing on specific portions of the photosynthetic process because those are the only things that are necessary for you understanding this difference between C3 and C4 plants. So um, that portion of photosynthesis. In, is involved in carbon capture, capturing carbon dioxide that is floating around in the atmosphere and binding it to other molecules inside of the plant. And so we're going to talk briefly about the light dependent reactions, but those reactions are just involved in creating the energy that the plant uses to actually build molecules of glucose. Glucose is the sugar that, that the plants create in photosynthesis. And so we're going to just touch on that briefly because we want to pay attention to the beginning phases of the light independent reactions. So, um, so you need to know about carbon fixation, this capturing of carbon out of the atmosphere, how that differs in C3 and C4 plants. Uh, you need to be able to relate the differences between the C3 and C4 pathways in terms of how efficient photosynthesis is under different kinds of conditions of temperature and moisture. And then be able to relate those two pathways to uh, why we grow things like corn in certain parts of the country and things like wheat and soybeans in other parts of the country in the United States. Because whether you're a C3 plant or a C4 plant, that determines um, how efficient you are at using water. And then that affects uh, where we can, we can plant crops. So it's all getting at we're going through photosynthesis because we need to understand certain things about the pollen book, 
but then we are also talking about photosynthesis because we need to understand photosynthesis to explain certain things about why we grow a lot of corn and soybeans here in the Midwest. We don't really grow corn and soybeans on the East Coast of the United States. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, so photosynthesis is just the process by which a plant takes carbon dioxide, which is CO2, and water, which is H2O, and they convert it to glucose. Glucose is a six carbon sugar. So that's something that is important to know. Carbohydrates, so sugar is a type of carbohydrate. Can you guys say the board okay? All right, so carbohydrates, are, are things like uh, sugars and starches, and they generally have a form CH2O, a carbon kind of bonded to a water molecule. And so um, that's the general formula, and then you'll have repeating units of, of those things. And so um, it is, in a way, just combining carbon and water to a certain to a certain degree in a very simplistic way of thinking about it. So um, we'll look at the equation later, but really it's just taking carbon dioxide and water and putting them together to make sugar molecules. Photosynthesis occurs in two phases. We used to call these the light and dark phases of photosynthesis, but that's not a very good way of saying it. So now we use the light dependent reactions and the light independent reactions. And the reason we do it this way is because the light dependent reactions actually require light in order to, to operate. The light independent reactions, they go on during the light parts of the day and during the dark parts of the day, but it's just that they don't need the presence of light in order to operate. And like I said before, we're gonna touch lightly on the light dependent reactions. We're gonna spend most of our time talking about the light independent reactions because the light independent reactions are the reactions where the plant captures carbon, okay? So, let's talk just a minute about light. So this is a figure from, I think it's from your textbook actually. Um, and what we have is light varies depending on the wavelength of the light, so. Going back to physics, light can be thought of as, as being a waveform, and waves have a peak and a trough, and the difference between the peak and the trough and back to the next peak, this distance is the wavelength. And so some wavelength is really long, and other light has wavelengths that are really short. And so the wavelength that, that a particular type of electromagnetic, radi electromagnetic radiation has, uh, has a lot to do with the properties of that electromagnetic radiation. Now, this is the, this is the broad span of it. Gamma rays that have really uh, short wavelengths and radio waves that have really uh, high wavelengths but then there's this section in the middle that we call visible light. And um, I don't really care for this term visible light because it's very human centric sort of statement. Uh, this is the light that we can see. So the color of my blue shirt, we, we can see. And so there's an, a really narrow spectrum of electromagnetic radiation that is, uh, that is, um, detectable by our eyes. Now, if you are an insect, you can actually detect ultraviolet light. So you can see outside the visible light spectrum of humans. If you're a snake, you are capable of detecting, certain types of snakes are capable of detecting infrared light, which is, which is heat over here. And so humans have a, a very narrow range of, of electromagnetic detectability other species have abilities outside of our visual detection. Um, so 
when you see the term visible light, just know that that's just visible to humans, not visible to a moth, for example, or a butterfly. And then the other thing is that the, the reason that this is useful is from the standpoint of photosynthesis, most of the energy that is used in photosynthesis is found within this visible spectrum. So when we look at chlorophyll, chlorophyll is the light gathering pigment, the pigment that responds to light in plants that captures the energy in light. Um, once again, you should be familiar with this term from your textbook reading. Chlorophyll is um, absorbs light within a very narrow range of, of colors. It absorbs blue and violet light and it absorbs red and orange light. It doesn't tend to absorb light in these intermediate uh, wavelengths. So when you look at a leaf, this is something that's always difficult uh, sometimes for people to grasp. When you look at a leaf, it appears green. And the reason that it appears green is that it's absorbing all of the red orange wavelengths of light and it's absorbing the blue and violet wavelengths of light, which means that it then reflects back to you the wavelengths that are not absorbed. And so you guys see what color shirt I'm wearing, right? Mm -hmm. What color is it? Blue. It's blue. This means that my shirt has pigments in it and those pigments absorb all of the green, all of the yellow, all of the orange, all of the red wavelengths, and it only reflects back the blue wavelengths. So it's not absorbing blue light, it's absorbing all of the other wavelengths of light and reflecting back to you the wavelengths of light that fall in the blue range. And so leaves are green because leaves don't absorb green wavelengths of light. This light absorption, so, so photons of light, these, these particles of light that are coming from the sun, they possess energy. And when they come into contact with pigments like chlorophyll, those pigments interact with those photons and actually absorb the energy of those photons. And so this is how plants ultimately, um, ultimately capture sunlight and, and the energy in sunlight. And they do this in chloroplasts. So if you look at the mesophyll cells, whether it's palisade mesophyll up here, or whether it's spongy mesophyll down here, embedded in each of these cells are little greenish spheres. And they're illustrated in this figure. And they are also found, oh crud, I, I switched slides. Let me go back. Oh, I have it. In, uh, ah. There are also all these little green dots in that figure that we were looking at earlier. Um, so these chloroplasts, these green spheres, these chloroplasts have a membranous structure inside of them. I'm not gonna ask you to know all of the names of, of these membranes, but just know that these membranes are, are inside of the chloroplast and embedded in the membrane of the chloroplast are these chlorophyll molecules, these, these pigment molecules that are capable of absorbing the light that is coming to them and, and harvesting the energy of those lights, that, those light waves. And so it's the chloroplast and the chlorophyll in the chloroplast that are actually responsible for initially capturing energy. You'll see that in a plant, they're distributed in the middle of the leaf. The epidermal layers don't really have chloroplasts, either the lower epidermis or the upper epidermis. It's the, the mesophyll cells that, that do the work of photosynthesis. So this is the equation for photosynthesis. Once again, I'm not going to require that you memorize this equation, but there are some aspects of the equation that I want you to recognize. First, you have to have carbon dioxide and you have to have water. On this side of the equation, these things are called the reactants. 
in chemistry language, but they're the things that are going to be used to do whatever the equation is doing. So we have carbon dioxide and we have water. And we're going to convert that carbon dioxide and water into a more complicated molecule called glucose. Glucose has the formula C6H12O6. And all that really means is that we have six carbons, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. So the six refers to how many atoms of each there are. Now, I, I'm not going to make you balance this equation. It's already balanced for you. But in order to get a six-carbon compound out of a single-carbon compound, you have to have six of them. And so when we balance an equation, all the things on one side of the equation have to equal up to all of the things on the other side of the equation. So things you need to know is that carbon dioxide and water are going to be combined to form a more complicated structure, this glucose molecule. And the byproducts of this equation are that it produces oxygen, which is interesting to know, but, but not crucial to know. And you also have water as a byproduct. And then you need some, some things in order for this to happen. You need chlorophyll molecules to capture the energy of light. And you need uh, an enzyme called Rubisco. All right, I think all of you had to take a biology class when you were in high school. And I realize high school is some distance away. Do you guys remember what an enzyme does? Anybody remember what an enzyme does? All right, you're all there at your computers, and you should have a, a textbook someplace. Some, uh, go, go to your computer or your textbook and look up what an enzyme does. And you can just speak it into my ear because I have my wireless earphones on. I'm just finding that they eat up the rate of the chemical reactions. Okay, so that's a that's a really common uh, definition of an enzyme. It makes a chemical reaction proceed faster. So in chemistry, we tend to graph it like this. On the x-axis here is the progress of a reaction, and we have the energy state on the y-axis of the, the things that are happening in the reaction. Now in photosynthesis, um, carbon dioxide and water are both really low energy compounds. There's not a lot of energy tied up in the bonds that connect carbon and oxygen, and there's not a lot of energy in the bonds that connect hydrogen and oxygen and water. And so for photosynthesis, we start off with low energy molecules, carbon dioxide and water, and we're going to be combining these things into a high energy molecule, which is glucose. And so we have to have energy input into the system in order to get this reaction to go, and that energy is coming from sunlight. And so what happens when this energy, when this, um, when this reaction goes is you have to add energy. So you add energy and add energy and add energy. And when you have added enough energy, you kind of go over this hump and then you end up with glucose at the end. And this amount of energy from here to here 
is the amount of energy that you need to add in order for this reaction to progress. So one of the things that an enzyme can be thought of as doing is speeding up the rate at which this reaction goes from the reactants to the product glucose. But now my question is there's another way of thinking about an enzyme that influences the rate but deals more with this energy issue. What else, what's another way of thinking about enzymes rather than thinking about the rate of reaction? has to do with the energy that's required for the reaction to go to completion. Anybody find anything about that? Are you continuing to look? Yeah, I'm just a little confused like what exactly you're asking. So, so one way of thinking about an enzyme is to think about how quickly a reaction goes to completion. So if you, if you threw a bunch of carbon dioxide and water together and, and we're trying to get glucose, you can measure the rate of reaction by seeing how fast glucose forms. But the way in which you speed up the reaction is by doing something to the energy that is required for the reaction to occur. You can speed up a reaction if you change the amount of energy that is required for the reaction to be completed. What would be the direction of that change? Would you need to change it so that there's more energy or less energy put into the system to get the reaction to go to completion? Assume less energy. Yeah, and so another way of thinking about an enzyme is that one of the things that it does is it lowers the amount of energy that is required for the reaction to proceed. So what an enzyme will do is it will take this curve of energy that has to go into the system in order to get the reaction to, to work, and it will lower it. Uh, so this energy is called the energy of activation, if you take chemistry class. And so one of the things that that an enzyme does is it reduces the amount of energy that is required for a reaction to proceed. So um, here's a good way of thinking about this. Um, so we have, we have this equation that is in front of us, right? That is the, the photosynthesis equation. This is taking carbon dioxide, and water using energy and chlorophyll and rubisco, which is an enzyme to create glucose and water and oxygen. I'm not gonna balance it, but the balance version is on there. When you eat food, one of the things that you get out of the food that you eat is you get energy. And your body stores energy in the form of glucose the same way plants store energy in the form of glucose. And so when you need energy, when you go to football practice or swim practice, or you're just sitting in your room and you need mental energy to do your homework, you basically take this glucose and through a really complicated process that we're not going to talk about much in this class, you combine it with oxygen. And this all gets reduced down to water and CO2, carbon dioxide. And so you get all of your energy from the stored form of energy that you get from the plants you eat and the other animals that you eat, fungi that you eat, et cetera, et cetera. So let me find something. Well, okay, I have a roll of paper towels. Paper towels are ultimately made from what? Paper. Where do we get paper towels from? What's that? 
paper. Okay, but where do we get paper from? Trees. Okay, so it comes from wood pulp. So we cut down trees, we grind them up, we, we grind them into ever smaller portions, and then we bind them together to make paper towels. If I was to take a match to this set of paper towels, what would happen to it? Burn. Yeah, we catch on fire and it would burn. In this situation, going from glucose to water and carbon dioxide, rather than starting with low energy molecules and going to high energy molecules, we actually start with a high energy molecule, 26H12O6, and we go to low energy molecules of carbon dioxide and water. But in order to do that, we have to add a lot of energy to the, to the reaction in the form of a lit match to get this to start burning. Wood from a tree is basically just a bunch of glucose molecules all bound together in a particular way. It's, it's cellulose. So what I have in my hand is a roll of cellulose. And if I put a match to this, it will burn. It will release a bunch of heat. As, this, as these compounds lose all of their energy, it releases it all in the form of heat, and it will form a lot of carbon dioxide and water. Um, did you guys watch the movie The Martian with Matt Damon? Anybody see the movie? No. No? Yeah. Yes. Who said yes? Okay. Um, when Matt Damon was stranded on the Martian planet, one of his first challenges was making water, right? Do you remember this part of the movie, Kitten? Mm -hmm. what, did he, what did he do to make water? Mm. Do you recall? I can't recall, no. He burned the fuel from his, his rocket thing that got him to Mars. He had leftover excess fuel, and he burned that fuel because when you burn something, when you combust something, two of the products are carbon dioxide and water. And so you can burn something, and when you burn it, one of the things that it does is it releases water. So if I were to burn this in my office, um, it would use up all the oxygen and kill me. But the other thing that it would do is it would provide water. It would release water in the process of doing this. So this is glucose bound together in cellulose. It's the same molecule that you have in your body that you break down for energy. So the question is, why do we not spontaneously combust? Why do I not burst into flame when I'm sitting in my chair? Because I am expending energy. That energy is coming from glucose, but I'm not catching fire. So why am I not spontaneously combusting? Class would be funner that way maybe, but I'm not combusting, I'm here not catching on fire. Why is that? Is it because of how quick the reaction happens? Okay, repeat that. Is it because of how quick the reaction happens? So like, it doesn't provide enough heat over a certain amount of time to actually catch anything else on fire? Okay, so, um, so the, you're thinking about kind of how quickly the reaction is, which is the first way of thinking about what enzymes do. So when you break down glucose in your body, it's done using a bunch of enzymes to facilitate that transition. When you light a roll of paper towels on fire, there are no enzymes involved, and so it just kind of goes uncontrollably. So rather than think about enzymes as something that speeds up the reaction, we can also think about enzymes in terms of how much energy you need for the for the reaction to go to completion, right? So your enzymes in your body, what, is it, what does it do to this reaction? It lowers the amount required. Lowers the amount required. So it lowers the amount of energy that you need to get the reaction started. And so we can, we can take the reaction of breaking glucose down into carbon dioxide and water that releases the energy that is in carbon dioxide, and we can do that at much lower temperatures 
because it's being facilitated by enzymes. So I actually find thinking about enzymes in terms of energy required for a reaction to go to completion rather than the speed of the reaction because it's the difference between me bursting into flames in my chair versus me sitting here and, and, and talking to you. Because the energy required for that ener energy to be liberated is much lower because it's being facilitated by enzymes rather than an uncontrolled conflagration of Dr. Kowitzki and his office. Although that would make great reporting for the Hilltop Monitor. Ecology professor burst into flames while on Zoom. All the students saw it and they were scarred forever. That would be not so good. So thank God for enzymes. So Rubisco, we've, we've had this little diversion into thinking about energy. Rubisco is an enzyme that allows plants to do this conversion of carbon dioxide and water to glucose with as little energy as possible. So it reduces the amount of energy that is required to facilitate this reaction. Now, Rubisco has a weird name, and you see that I've written it strangely. A capital R, a capital B, and then a capital C and an O. And this is because Rubisco is an enzyme that works on a particular substrate, a particular compound, and it has two different functions. It has a carboxylase function and an oxygenase function. So, So you can think of Rubisco like this. Ru, Bisco, Ru, Bis, C, and O. Ru is short for ribulose. Ribulose is a type of sugar. Bisphosphate basically means that there are two phosphate molecules that are added to this sugar. So this is just telling you about the nature of a sugar that is found in plant cells. Carboxylase, anytime you see ASE at the end of a word, that indicates that it's an enzyme. So carboxylase is an enzymatic function that adds carbon dioxide to something. In this case, it's adding carbox carbon dioxide to ribulose bisphosphate but it also functions as an oxygenase. Once again, ACE means that it's an enzyme, but in this case, it's adding oxygen to ribulose bisphosphate. So Rubisco is an enzyme that is capable of adding either carbon dioxide or oxygen to this other compound called ribulose bisphosphate, which is just a, a five carbon sugar. This is a five carbon sugar. So that's the, that's the nature of the, of the word. Now, I do want you to know that. Why do I want you to know that? Well, because it's important for you to know that the thing that you add carbon dioxide to is a five carbon sugar, which then gives you now a six carbon molecule. So that's important to know, to understand the photosynthesis at the level that we need to understand it. And I want you to know the name because the fact that it's capable of adding carbon dioxide to a five carbon sugar, five carbon compound, and adding oxygen to a five carbon compound complicates things for plants as they go through the process of photosynthesis. And we'll see on Friday what that complication is. So I don't normally ask you to learn complicated sciencey stuff, but this is one of the big important things. The nature of this enzyme creates advantages to the plant because it allows them to do photosynthesis, but it is detrimental to plants in some ways because it has a dual function in terms of its enzyme. It can act to add carbon dioxide to a molecule, but it can also act to add oxygen to a molecule. And when you're making glucose, you want it to add carbon dioxide, you don't want it to add oxygen.
And so this is problematic for plants at times. So there's the, there's the, the name. And um, in C3 photosynthesis, the first intermediate product has six carbons. What it does is it adds one carbon to the five carbon ribulose bisphosphate to make a six carbon molecule that breaks down really quickly into two, three carbon molecules. And then C4 is, is a, a form of photosynthesis that occurs that starts with a four carbon molecule, which is why it's C3 versus C4. And C3 photosynthesis occurs in the mesophyll cells primarily. So uh, we're at 10.01, and uh, I feel like I've loaded a ton of stuff on you. Uh, what questions do you have at this point about this material so far? I was gonna ask, all these slides are on Moodle, right? They are, yep. You could have downloaded them and been looking at them on your screen, but you can also see them here. But yeah, they're, they're on Moodle as well. Under, under the September 2nd materials folder. Yep, who's that? It was Winston. Oh, Winston, okay. Other questions about this? What I'm doing now is giving you some, some base knowledge that we need to have in order to then begin to study the process. And so what we're gonna do on Friday is we're gonna add a little more to this base knowledge and then we're going to go through the process of photosynthesis in kind of a linear fashion of how it goes step by step. And then hopefully at the end of class on Friday, I'll give you some, some strategies for how to remember this, because this is one of the more complicated uh, processes that you're going to have to learn in this class. And I'm trying to be careful about what I give you and what I'm expecting of you so that it's all relevant to knowing knowing just enough to be dangerous, sort of, just enough to understand why you would need to know something about photosynthesis without bogging you down in, in a lot of detail. Um, so hopefully that works. We'll see. Any other questions? All right, then I will see you on Friday. Hey, Judy. You are gone.